Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Lee Whitmore. I am the Vice President for Education at Focusrite Group. Focusrite Group includes Focusrite, Novation, Sequential, Oberheim, Adam Audio, Martin Audio, Optimal Audio, Linear Research, and Sonox, our partner in today's masterclass and career-focused discussion on mastering. Couldn't be more happy than this opportunity to welcome you all in, and we have some amazing panelists today who work as professional mastering engineers who have made uh, the creation of music and audio, the production of it, and the teaching of it uh, critical to their lives. And all, like uh, all of us at Focusrite Group, are very concerned about supporting next-gen professionals. So we have lots of students in the audience today, lots of faculty members, educators, and professionals. And I'm very happy to now introduce our panelists, Mauricio Jargel, who's from Middle Tennessee State University and has, as you'll learn, a significant mastering studio and practice in Sao Paulo in Brazil. We also have Idania Valencia, who is a mastering engineer at Sterling Sound in the New York metro area. Um, also another friend and colleague, Brian Smithers from Full Sail University. And two of my colleagues from Focusrite Group, both Giles Farley and Andy Kelly, who are joining us live from the UK. There they are. Thank you, gentlemen. And all of you for being here on the panel today. To kick it off, I'll ask our panelists to tell us a little bit more about themselves. And so let's first uh, start with Mauricio. We'll go around the the, uh, the circle of panelists in the same way that I just introduced you. And I'll ask each of you, Mauricio, then Idania, then Brian, tell our audience a little bit about yourself. Uh, in addition to what I pointed out, where you're working, um, some of your career passions, where you focus the music and audio production as a mastering engineer or educator, uh, just give us a little bit more depth than I did in the very brief introduction. So, Mauricio, all to you. Yeah, you're muted. Oh, why? I did that wrong, didn't I? So. I'm just a mastering engineer, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure for me to be here. Uh, you know, I am, currently I am assistant professor at MTSU and I teach critical listening classes and some hands-on classes for like recording and basics of, you know, routing and consoles and also a fundamental audio on, you know, the, the basics and the theory of audio. Uh, I started around, uh, I would say, 25 years ago as a freelancer, basically. You know, I did a little bit of everything. I would never say no to anything, even live sound. You know, I did some of that. It was always, like, exciting to, you know, to get the invitation to go to do live sound. And I was like, eh, it's kind of uncomfortable to me, but never say no. Never said no. I just did it. So... A lot of you know editing work, more like auto tuning in the beginning, and my focus was I think in the studio work, you know. And eventually, I start mixing records and uh, recording, recording live, recording in the studio, always as a freelancer, basically. I always like to study, you know, and kind of understand what's in in the background of all our tools and all that. So I. You know, very soon in my journey, I I got a membership with AES, and I am a member there since forever. Uh, of course, you know the the society has been instrumental for me in my advance and my progress. So after 15 years working professionally, I went back to school. I went to MTSU to work on my graduate degree, and then back to my country in Brazil. I started my mastering room there, and now I'm back to Nashville, back to Tennessee as a faculty member, so alumni faculty member, faculty member in Tennessee, uh, and that's about it. You know, I mean, there, there was I've made many more friends than enemies, so I'm happy about that. And thanks again. 
of course. And we're happy to consider you a friend in the circle of uh, all the work we're doing to support uh, music and audio education. And for folks who are coming up and looking toward careers like yours and our other panelists as pros. So great to have you here. And next, let's go to Adania. It's really a pleasure to have you here today, Adania. Tell us a little Hi. bit more about yourself and your background. Yes, hi all. Uh, very happy to be here. Um, well, I I studied at Full Sail University and uh, recording arts. Before that, I studied something similar in where I'm from in Mexico, uh, music production. And I, before going to Full Sail, I think I already had an idea of uh, mastering, like as something I wanted to do. But uh, I worked for a little bit in a radio station that just like recorded live shows and stuff. And then I went to Full Sail and with in mind of uh, definitely probably pursuing mastering. And as soon as I graduated, I started uh, searching for opportunities to intern as a mastering engineer. And I moved to New York City and I applied to absolutely all the studios I could apply. And incredibly, Sterling Sound, where I work now, they they replied. Well, I, I, I went in person and left my resume because I had called before and they told me that they didn't uh, have interns in the studio and, you know, but to send my resume just in case. But then, um, since I moved to New York, I went and leave it again. And that's when it sticked, thankfully. So I got a call to come in for an interview and I started interning and I was an intern for about three months. And after that, I um, things aligned and I got a permanent position. And uh, my first years at Sterling were strictly as a production engineer. So this is uh, something we do in mastering, which is just, you know, taking care of parts and QC and assisting our engineer. So it was it was more like on the post production side kind of. And yeah, over the years, I started like getting more experience and doing my own mastering. And then I became an engineer for Sterling Sound. And that's basically it. Congratulations. Well, that's a wonderful path. And it's great to hear that that journey that you've taken. And we'll hear more about that. And also how fun, of course, we came to know you. I did, uh, thanks to uh, the partnership that Focus Right Group and our brands have with Full Sail University and Winter Park. And also, of course, we work very closely with their sister schools at LA Film, Los Angeles Recording School, and also at the Rocky Mountain College of Art and Design. But today we have my good friend who I spend a lot of time with. Thank you, Brian. I'm an executive board member for the MIDI Association and Brian serves regularly on the MIDI and Music Education Working Group. And what Brian and I, and I have known each other for many years, but we've been working a lot more closely over the past couple. Brian, tell us about your role at Full Sail, your tenure there. And also, I know you have a significant professional career in music, music performance, technology, and more. So I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Lee. It's, it's great to be here, especially in such uh, such fabulous company today. Um, as you said, I'm, I started as a musician. I'm still a musician. I, everything that I have done in my career has been focused around that. Um, I was, uh, both of my degrees are in saxophone performance and I was a staff musician at Walt Disney World for uh, almost a decade and a half playing various woodwinds and conducting and arranging. But I started getting involved in recording and music technology. I wound up uh, with some opportunities to write uh, quite a bit for electronic musician uh, on recording and music technology and hardware and software and, and sound design and all kinds of, of cool stuff. They gave me some great opportunities there. Um, so I've been writing about uh, music technology since the late 90s. Uh, but in 2000, I had an opportunity to join the faculty at Full Sail University, uh, where I've taught 
courses from uh, MIDI to audio workstations to audio foundations to digital audio theory. Um, and when it came time for us to launch uh, our uh, online audio production degree program eight or so years ago, um, I was asked to, uh, to head that effort. And uh, so now I'm the program director uh, of the audio production degree program here. And uh, so that's kind of where I am. I've, I've taught a bunch of different aspects of, uh, uh, of audio and had my hands in, uh, in a lot of different things, probably focusing more on the classical and jazz uh, uh, genres than, uh, than anything else. Um, and that, that's kind of where I am and, and what I do today. Fantastic. Well, thank you, Brian, Idania, Mauricio. Excuse me. I will tell you, um, and welcome to everyone in our audience. Giles and uh, Andy, I'm going to pivot to you in just a moment. Um, but of course, we've got three panelists here that are living in the States now. Uh, some have come from other places in uh, Latin America. Um, we're just about to jump across the pond for a conversation to the UK. And I will tell you, audience members, what wonderful participation and pre-registration. Those of you who pre-registered for this event submitted questions. We will dig into them in depth during the conversation today. I have many lined up here. I chose them while we had more than we could possibly, and thank you, address in the conversation here today. We'll cover the key topics. I sorted them by sort of topics of interest. And you can ask questions. Anybody in the audience who didn't pre-submit a question, you're watching this through our Focus Right YouTube channel. You can use the chat actively. And uh, one of our colleagues in my team at Focus Right, Dave Riley, is there to answer questions and to respond about anything that you may have or want to ask. Uh, I also can, and the panelists can see your questions come in. So do feel free to drop those in the chat as we go along. And thank you all for the wonderful participation in this event from Europe, from Latin America, from North America, Canada and the US, <coughs> and from Asia and the Asia Pacific region. So let's jump across the Atlantic and have a quick hello with Giles and Andy from our uh, uh, part of our team here at Focusrite Group. I'll start with you, Giles, some quick introductions. Tell everybody where you are because you're in a really beautiful place in the world also. We are, yeah, we're very close to the city of Oxford. Um, and if your uh, navigation of the UK involves um, audio companies, we're very close to SSM. Um, we should probably start, given that we're English, with an apology. It's a, a cultural requirement. Um, we're both sorry that we're not mastering engineers. Um, uh, we actually are, no apology coming. Um, we represent the sales and marketing department of Sonox. But the truth is, is it's a very small company and a significant part of our role is in the product discovery group, really exciting part of the company, where we go looking for problems to solve. Um, prior to Sonox, um, I've had pretty much all of my adult life um, in pro audio of some sort. I was a musician um, and then fell into a job with DigiDesign um, prior to them being bought with by, by Avid, and the product there was Pro Tools, so I'm enormously proud to have been involved in the early days of that. And then fell, this, this theme will develop, uh, I fell into another job in um, film post-production, which I stayed at for about 14 years, um, before coming full circle back to software um, and Sonops about 10 years ago. So that's the whistle-stop career journey. I'll make mine even more brief. Um, Originally, uh, but, you know, studio and live experience, uh, then went on to music education um, and then to Sonox. And that's probably as much as you need to know about me. Um, we, I we should say, realistically, though, we are both uh, audio nerds. We are part yeah. of the product discovery team and things. So we, we, we can help with yeah. um, those kind of things. We're not just going to try and sell you things. No. Don't worry. I think also important to note, we're gently failing musicians. That's a prerequisite of working here. As is an awful sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's great to have you here. And um, to the audience, Giles and Andy are ready to do some just general demonstrations about topics that we may talk about, things that may come up um, to evidence um, you know, solutions or to evidence things that are challenges 
when you work as a mastering engineer. So we're really happy to have you here. And um, I will say thank you for all of those, uh, all of you who have pre-registered, you're getting access to some Sonox plugins as a part of this event. And we will also, Giles and I tell you later about the support that we in Focusrite Group and in Sonox offer for all educators and all students. So that'll come a little bit later in the conversation. So thank you all. Now we'll continue and jump into sort of the meat of the conversation. It's great to get all of your backgrounds though, because the conversation here is, is solidly focused on mastering, mastering as a career, what you need to become a mastering engineer, things that came up in the pre-submitted questions included what's your toolkit, what kind of gear, what kind of projects, um, how has the uh, profession of work, working as a mastering engineer changed. And we know it has changed significantly over the last five, 10 years. And so all of these things are on the table. Um, before we jump into questions from our audience and pre-submitted questions though, um, I'd like to start, uh, let's start with you Adani and then we'll go to Mauricio. And I've, by the way, everybody in the audience, I've invited any of our panelists to jump in. We love a, an organic conversation and we look forward to your questions. But I think Adani, you, you talked a little bit about your path and you worked in radio and then you ended up at Sterling and I applaud you for showing up and knocking on the door. That's how it happens. That's essentially how I got my first job in the industry uh, quite a long while ago. Um, but, you know, based on your training at Full Sail, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about the things that you learned in your program at Full Sail that helped contribute to or helps contribute to making you successful today. But yeah. dig, in, dig in a little bit more. Like you went through that path at Full Sail. I'm guessing when you got to Full Sail, you weren't thinking, I'm going to be working as a mastering engineer and being successful at Sterling. Tell us oh, a little no. bit about that. What's that evolution from how you, how you started your program at Full Sail, what you thought you were going to do? I'm imagining yes. for all of us, we're, and we've ended up as professionals doing things that are a little bit different than our initial vision. And then sort of give us that, um, that arc of how you got to where you are today. Yes, so it actually starts before full sail because as I mentioned, when I lived in Mexico, I went there to school to, to university for um, audio production and engineering too. And at the same time, I was doing music, a contemporary music composition. And it happened because I, I wanted to write songs and I wanted to be a composer, but my parents, they were like, uh, well, um, okay, like this is a risky career, you can do it, but we just ask you that you also do this like music production and engineering like career that's in the same school because you know, just to have a backup. And I was like, well, okay, you know, that was the only way they were gonna let me like do what I wanted and it, it was okay, but the crazy thing is that as like the 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 program went by, I started realizing that I really liked the production side of things, and um, I had no clue, no idea uh, of of really everything that you could do, and all the like specialities you could take, and. Towards the end of that career, we got like a little mastering class. And I was like, damn, I really like this. It sounds like it just, it was just so interesting to me how you could like take a almost finished pro like song and just like add to it, you know, like with a little bit of EQ and all the technicalities about it, I really liked because I, I, I've always been very geeky like that. So it was, it was just like, you know, this is so technical, but also kind of artistic at the same time. So it was, I, I was really excited about it, about that. And I also somehow thought that um, mastering would be a good thing to pair like with music composition, in the sense that I would probably be able to kind of do, do both. And so after I graduated from that school, I, I wanted to kind of like learn a little bit more of the technical side. So that's how I end up going to Full Sail University. And obviously uh, they, there, there was some things that I kind of already knew, but 
it's just the the way that for example wholesale works where you have classes and then they're followed by like a lab it just really helps you cement knowledge so much and i don't know it was it was a really good time there and i already knew since the beginning that when we got more into like um mixing and mastering and all of that i i would like end up making a decision if that was the path i wanted to take i i also really liked um vocal production and um so yeah, then we also had a little mastering course um, at Full Sail, where I learned to use Sequoia, which is the software I use now. And it is important because that's the thing in my resume that got me the job at, at Sterling Sound. Because my um, the my my boss at the time, Tom Coyne, he that's the software he used. So when he saw that I had that on my resume. He was like, oh, yeah, she knows Sequoia. That's like a good thing. I really, I mean, honestly, knew it very little, but I, I knew it and I knew it existed and I could use it. So, so yes, yeah, so right after I graduated from Full Sail, you know, they, they help you with your resume to send it and to like polish it up and stuff. And I send it to all the studios I could think of in Manhattan, Brooklyn, Queens, even near, in like the New Jersey area. And very few people responded to me, to be honest. Uh, but then I end up going to New York anyway. And that's when I did like, um, I went and le le left my resume in person. I left it at Sterling Sound and at other two studios. And I obviously I had no expectations about Sterling Sound because it's a really big studio. So I was just thinking, you know, maybe like the more in independent ones, you know, they might need like some help and stuff. But um, yeah, they they end up giving me the call. And at the beginning, uh, my job at Sterling Sound was very basic. So basically things that I learned at Full Sail, like critical listening, uh, some basics of um, just like music theory and just knowing a little bit of the software and, you know, knowing how distortion sounds, how click sound, how uh, like weirdness in audio from processing sounds, all of that uh, kind of helped me at the beginning. Obviously, it was a lot of training uh, because it was, it was a lot of ye like years of just QC, which um, it might sound boring, but it wasn't because it's a, it's a lot of new music and cool music. And not only that, like all those hours of listening uh, really trained me to be able to be a mastering engineer in the future, because then you have an idea of how things are supposed to sound. Like if you've been listening to music eight hours a day for four or five years, like you get a really clear clue of like how genre sound and how when something is just wacky and not sounding good and or if something is too loud if something's kind of quiet and yeah all of that so uh that's super yeah. helpful um no it's i think it's important for everybody in the audience and i'm already checking this the chat stream from the YouTube uh, uh, chat function in our live stream channel and um, lots of positive comments. Um, by the way, I, I called out a bunch of locations around the planet and thank you all for letting me know that you're also from some other places that I didn't mention, including Italy, Croatia, from Peru. Um, welcome to everyone. It's great to hear you all um, and see you all here rather. Um, and so Ma Mauricio, your journey and path has been a little bit, has been different, all of ours are, than Idania. And I, I want to tell everyone I had the pleasure of first meeting Mauricio in Nashville not too long ago at the Guitar Center Pro Custom House, where we have a lovely new Adam Audio and Focusrite um, Red, RedNet uh, immersive room. And we had visits that day. Mauricio came in. And I had learned from my Latin America colleagues, who for Focusrite Group are based mostly in uh, Mexico City, 
and um, also outside of Sao Paulo, that they knew Mauricio very well. So I felt like we were bringing somebody in who was in the family and vice versa. He walked in, sat in the room, and of course turned his ears on. And um, I was very impressed, Mauricio, with just your approach to listening that day at GC Pro in the Custom House. And we had a wonderful chat about your background. So I'm excited to ask you to share with everyone else a little bit more about, you know, where'd you start? And then, you know, what did you think you'd do first? And how did you end up with your with your studio in Sao Paulo? And we know you're teaching now, but I think yeah. for everyone in the audience, they'll want to hear more about how you got to where you are. Sure. Yeah, you know, I am really dividing. I don't know if it's 50-50, probably not. This is my first semester here, so I'm really trying to, you know, understand the academic system and all that. And it's great. I mean, great people, great environment to be in. But yeah, you know, I've been always trying to do both, like teach and and work professionally. I mean, one kind of, it, it goes, you know, hand in hand. One thing supports the other, of course. But you know, I remember when I was a student here, and by the way, my top the topic of my thesis was immersive audio for music. You know, basically how to create compelling results. Uh, uh, but talking about music in immersive, which is still a challenge, you know. But, you know, I think I spent three years, maybe a little less than that, but, you know, a lot of readings before that. But, you know, trying stuff, you know, like experimenting, recording, mixing, uh, changing ambisonics orders and all that. And, well, I'm trying to say that I spent the best part of those three years immersed, you know, surrounded by 10, five, seven speakers, you know. And then I had my opportunity for like my work permit here, you know, after graduate. And I had the, the honor, I would say, you know, I, I consider like a lot of luck to have met Glenn Meadows from Nashville, great master engineer, like Totten, you know, he, he's, he was great. He passed away sadly, but, you know, and that was, that goes with what Idane was saying, like be a fly in the room and just like, I was just astonished. I was like, how is that possible? How can he change just enough to make this shine? And I say just enough it was like half a dB in 63 Hertz. You know, maybe one dB at 12, uh, maybe a little less, maybe point eight. And I was like, no, I can't. How, how is that happening? You know, I never listened to that. I mean, th is this room? No, it's his ears. What is that? And that kind of clicked to me like, all right, that's cool. You know, that's cool because somehow I feel very close to the songwriting. But he's mastering. I mean, supposedly this is the final stage. And then I start wondering, okay, what's the difference between songwriting and mastering and mixing and recording and perform? That's, it's, it's almost like, you know, I had the impression that mastering was like something else, very different. And then by looking at Glenn Meadows' work, I was like, he's doing the exactly same thing. He's doing music with tiny adjustments, but couldn't be more than that and couldn't be less than that. He just did what the song needed. And then, okay, okay, I think I can do this. And I couldn't, you know, because I didn't have the room, because I didn't have the ears. And But the, the first thing that he taught, he taught me, you know, I don't think he was teaching me. He was just like, you know, expressing his opinion, but I was sure learning. It was that, you know, what really matters he is to say from the front wall coming back. So first we have the wall itself, right? The room, and then you have the speakers. And then you must have a very clean path and a volume control. Everything beyond that, like back past that, is BS kind of, you know, because that, that's our only tools. And if you're not listening, forget it. So we have so I realized that. After, you know, maybe my case was a little bit different or maybe not, but I was a professional and I went back to school 
that's what I meant. So I had some year training, you know, I mean, in one way or another, I was just doing it. Not like a formal, you know, like critical listening class that which I actually got, you know, from a grad school. But before that, I was just listening. And I realized that, you know, after you're getting out of school, you need, I, I would just ballpark here, I, I would say you need five, six years just learning how to listen and what to listen before even touching anything. I mean, you can touch, you can screw things up, you know, and undo it maybe, but just be aware, you know, be conscious that you have a lot to learn. After, I mean, you took 12 credits more, but you still have to learn how to listen, and that's key. And again, I am so, you know, grateful for that moment when I could somehow connect everything. You know, it was like a insight kind of thing. Like, oh, I can connect technology to creativity, and I can connect mastering to songwriting. This all makes sense now to me. So it's really about, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people told me that, but it's different when you see it and say, okay. I mean, everybody, you never know, you know, where the opportunity will come from to learn what you need to know. But that was my story. You know, I was there in that room, I don't know, in a Wednesday afternoon or something like that. And I was like, God, I, I went back home just thinking, how was that possible? I think, I mean, that makes sense actually, but you know, it was a kind of a revelation. I don't know. And and then that kind of, you know, basic concept of having a very simple path and make sure that what we're listening is the truth kind of stuck to me. And, and you know, you may think, oh, that's easy. Just buy a pair of speakers, put some acoustic treatment, and you're done. It's not. I mean... Which is the good part, right? Uh, I think a lot of my job, especially now teaching, but I feel like a, as a engineer, actually, maybe, well, for a master engineer, I don't know, but, you know, part of the work, of course, is like doing the master, right? But like, again, like Idania said, you know, the geek part of testing converters, testing speakers, trying new gear, new plugins. That's that's your job. You think you have like free time and you're just like having fun. That's part of the work. And then there is the other part of the work, you know, when the clients like, you know, the, the phone rings or the email pops in and say, hey, I have a single. Well, of course, that's the job. But, you know, we are constantly learning. And I always try to be astonished, you know, like I, I, I always try to be kind of surprised by something as the same day I was surprised when I saw Glenn working. So that's my motto. Well, it's, it's clearly a transformative moment. And I know we've all had these things in our careers. It's something I love to bring up in these panel conversations. So thank you both for sharing those things. And um, I was, uh, I have a, uh, another region and um, Mauricio, we have uh, folks in the stream from Brazil. So bem-vindo to uh, our friend from Brazil who popped up and pointed out that I didn't mention that part of the world. It's great to have representation from all over the world today. Um, before we sort of geek out and get into workflows and talk about in the box, out of the box, uh, doing work in, you know, with earbuds versus, because we have questions about that. What, are the, what do my studio monitors need to look like? Um, Brian, I want to lean to you because Adania spent a little time talking about how Full Sail helped her prepare for her career path. So let's talk just a, a little bit about what's in program and what you as a program director in audio at Full Sail include and what things you think about in terms of making sure for those students who, I mean, do you encourage some to move toward and consider mastering where they may not have a conception or preconceptions that they have that need to sort of be steered? Um, how do you uh, factor this career path and discipline into what you train at Full Sail? Well, we get a lot of prospective students who say that, you know, I the only thing I need to do is I need to learn how to master my stuff. And the lesson which Idania had largely learned by the time she came to us 
is that there's a lot more to it than that. Uh, Idania and Mauricio have, have both given great uh, many dissertations on how the, the discipline is simultaneously extremely technical and extremely creative. You've got to have the, the knowledge and the, the kind of rigorous analytical approach. And you also have to just be completely committed to listening. Uh, and so we try to get people uh, listening to everything, listening to musical differences, listening to sonic differences, understanding in, in a course like uh, a sound design course that that you know well that doesn't have anything to do with mastering well it has everything to do with mastering because if you can't hear that a a background loop uh clicks every time that it loops around you're never going to be able to do the qc checks uh at at the the mastering facility uh you just haven't learned to listen carefully enough um I was also thinking, forgive me for uh, waxing rhapsodic a little bit here, but but as a musician, my harmony, as a musician, as a as a uh, an arranger, orchestrator, conductor, you are constantly massaging the tiniest sonic differences to play on people's emotions, whether it's asking as a conductor, asking the flutist to uh, back off just a little bit and the clarinetist to come forward just a little bit so that you get that sonic balance that really drives the point home in this particular moment. Um, whether it's as a, a musician on stage at a new uh, performing arts hall where you can hear not just the other musicians on stage, but the sound of the stage and the sound of the hall itself. Um, and hearing how all of these things interact to deliver something to the people in the seats. And if you come to the craft saying, I love music, I want to be involved in music, that is a great start, but it's about a 1% start because you have to learn to listen to so much, so carefully at such fine resolutions that you can actually do something with a major artist in the room and they can trust your judgment. And that is a, a huge area of growth for, for each and every one of us from the beginning of our career to, as Mauricio pointed out, on an ongoing basis. You are constantly getting your mind blown by what other people are doing uh, and and by the things that you're able to do when you're doing some experimentation in your downtime or or trying to you know stretch uh, stretch yourself a little bit uh, on actual projects. So engendering a love of the discipline, engendering a love of the the craft, and engendering a commitment to that kind of deep and lifelong learning, both technically, creatively, sonically, um, is really job one. Uh, the details of, you know, what are polar patterns? Uh, what do you mean by near field speakers? Um, uh, what, you know, what reflections in my room do I really need to be concerned with? And why is a big room uh, easier to tame than a small room? Those are technical details that everyone has access to, and we'll get to all of those. But engendering that kind of, of affection for commitment to the process, I think, is always job one. Yeah, that very, very poignant, Brian. And I'm so glad that you were to, able to share those perspec that perspective, those perspectives after Maurice, Mauricio and Adania. Um, so let's uh, start to geek out a little bit. We're here with Sonox, and I've got a lot of questions from the audience and pre-submitted from our registrants about things like, and I'm going to combine a couple things. Um, so Assad from Indonesia has asked, do we really need analog hardware today or is mixing in the box professional enough 
And I'll add to that because there are a couple of other questions here that um, sort of come together for me, which is, all right, we, Mauricio, you mentioned it and others have, like, what am I listening through? Am I doing that mixing in the box? And there are questions from the audience about, okay, what about headphones? Like I'm using earbuds for this right now, but certainly I, you know, I, I might listen this way. I might not be doing my critical mastering work that with what I have in my ears right now, not that they're not good. So hardware, software, kind of what's your toolkit, what's in your quiver, so to speak, to do your job. And, um, you know, what a thing, what about, you know, like, what are you mixing in? Um, I mentioned Mauricio was in the, the new immersive of room, the 7.1.4 room we have with Adam Audio in Nashville where we met, but in the box, analog hardware, what software tools are you using? And then let's talk about some some challenges and problems. I, I know that um, everybody here has uh, or uses Sonox plugins in their in their workflows. So um, uh, how about uh, Mauricio, I'll go to you first, then, then we'll come to Idania next. But um, I, I combined a, a bunch of things, but I'm also cognizant of time, and I think those things fit together a little bit. So I'll yeah. let you give us a perspective first. Sure, and you know, any of you, if you want to interrupt me, if you don't you know, keep the flow and momentum. The momentum is good. So if you have anything to comment, I, I mean, I don't, I don't care. You know, if you interrupt me, that's fine. That's good. Uh, well, you know, uh, tools. What I use, I use. Uh, I, I'm currently using a pair of PMC 6 uh, I'm I was very used to the IB2s with uh, Bryston amplifier, uh, the 7B, no, the 4B, I'm sorry. And that was my kind of my home, you know, like I could, if I had those in front of me, I could understand that. That was my, you know, my safe place kind of. So like recently I moved to, the, to Nashville and... I just decided to go with a, like a more modern version, you know, of the PMCs and uh, the six twos. They have DSP, so I do have a little bit of EQ in my room, but it's not like to trying to, you know, force anything like correct room, as they say. It's just like you know, a little cut, maybe a little shelf in the highs above seven K, just because, you know sound too bright to me maybe that's my room i don't know but it's that kind of thing that you know uh, there it's an eq it's not i mean that's not a problem that i'm trying to solve it's just a taste it's like a 2 db you know attenuation in the high end it sounds more comfortable to me uh so that that that's that you know a pair of pmcs with uh, a prism sound converter and software-wise, I'm using WaveLab, and you know, and some other applications like Isotope for maybe, you know, uh, spectral editing, like noise and stuff. But yeah, my my mastering uh, DAW, so to speak, is the it's WaveLab. Uh, what else? Well, you know, I think that that's. The key, you know, good converters and a good pair of speakers in the room, that's kind of 80%, maybe, you know, but you do need the tools. So uh, I do use Sonox limiters and uh, the Pro Kodak, that's a time saver for me, you know, like for all the clients ask me for like an MP3 for reference or for whatever they need. Uh, Pro Kodak has the limiter there, so it avoids any, you know, kind of overshot or anything uh, and it's great for metadata too but yeah i use you know dmg plugins i use sonox limiters uh, i love sonox limiters when especially when i need well this might be wrong and then you know gills and andy you correct me but <laughs> somehow i trust them for like an extra if the clients really want something loud that's easier you know, it's not to say that they work for everything. They do have a sound, but, I mean, you, you can be transparent also. So I use Sonox limiters, you know, uh, start with, like, the safe mode off, maybe, you know, maybe 10% or less of that 
I forgot the name of that slider there. What's the name of the enhancer? Yeah. So, you know, it's it's a it's it's definitely my template. You know, I start with it. Maybe it doesn't fit the song, but many times it does, so it's good. Uh I like the, the the metering, you know, that's kind of silly to say that, but in the inflator, I use the metering a lot, you know, sometimes, uh, even if I want to just clip a little bit, uh, sometimes metering, I, I feel like the metering in the Sonox plugins are really precise somehow. I don't know. I just trust them. And, you know, I think the big disruption in mastering to me, and this may be another question, but another you know for another time uh is the immersive mastering i I'm, I'm really it's a real challenge you know i wonder what was the challenge when people were trying to cut vinyls for the first time is trying to cut a mastering atmos it's like, just like frustrating but exciting at the same time you know like mm. again what i i think what i've got like i said my moto thing from 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 that day with glam was like hey songwriting and mastering goes you know hand in hand right they go together and many times i feel like what's happening with immersive mastering is like a disruption with the original intents of the artist and again that's a philosophical discussion so i am still looking for my workflow you know regarding like immersive mastering it's still, it is a moving target, we know that, but in terms of my tools and my workflow, believe me or not, I'm still experimenting with that. I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> like a definite wow. workflow. For stereo, it's pretty good. You know, I, you know, I have the workflow of upsampling everything to 96K, you know, like from the, from the start. And then I create the deliverables after that, after mastering, of course, but then I, you know, I kind of work from that mother kind of high resolution file. Uh, one last thing I would like to mention is that I am not using analog tools anymore. I used to use analog EQs and compressors and tube stuff. And then maybe the good thing, if I can say that about COVID, you know, is that I had to stay away from the studio. So I was trying to reserve my my presential you know work like my in person in the room to one day a week in the in the in those in that in that time of like very bad covid so i was just using the room and trying to avoid you know analog gear and and then i had a setup at home where i could like tweak stuff redo fades and assembling and you know work on the on the deliverables things that i could do on headphones so, but I had to avoid the analog. So otherwise any recall would require me to be in the room. You know, and then I I kind of start confirming what I was already suspecting that, oh, I don't need that. You know, I really need to listen well, you know, to be, to have a proper monitoring and good tools. And if I have to go like dirty, like let's say dirty mastering, like, you know, very colorful and, I can do that with plugins too, you know, distortion, whatever uh, you have to do. Or if I have to be very clean, well, you know, I start developing my tools in the in the in the box world, kind of. All right, I think I have something to learn here. I was use it to my pendulum, to my Mazalek, to my you know, uh, uh, Baxendal and all that. But you know, maybe I have to look for that in the box. And I found it works for me. So I don't think you need, I mean, you can use anything for mastering, but they don't must be analog anymore, in my opinion. So Mar Mauricio, great comments. And I will tell everyone, we have a regular spring, um, uh, fall and spring events uh, called the Focusrite Group and Education Pro Audio. 
an education webinar series. And in the spring, we will focus on mastering. In fact, that event will be captured and streamed live from Full Sail during their Hall of Fame week. And Mauricio, maybe we need to bring you back in for that conversation to talk a little bit about uh, mastering and immersive. And Adania, you also, since this is a masterclass, I, I think this is a good opportunity to bring our friends Giles and Andy in a little bit because one of the, there were many questions about limiters in mastering. In fact, I started to mention earlier, there's uh, um, someone from, ah, uh, Instituto Superior uh, de Musica in Argentina, who asks simply, what, what is it that I'm doing? How am I using a limiter in my mastering process? What should I be thinking about? So I know Mauricio and Idani, you both do. We've got Giles there. So I wonder, let's talk a little bit. Let's give a bit of a masterclass and talk with the audience and the students and career professionals here. Um, what do you think, Adania, how do you approach, I don't know, Giles and Andy, might, I know we have some music, I think it would be great for everybody to hear something too. So I'll just open the floor up to let's talk a little bit to everyone who's here about, you know, what's what are the key insights that you want to suggest for um, an aspiring career mastering engineer? And we've got some examples that Andy and, and Giles can can bring in, I think. Sure. Um, I think just echoing something that Maurizio said a moment ago, that a sort of suite of tools with different characteristics, different sounds, having that palette is a real you know, advantage where it comes to different genres, different uh, types of, of music. We've kind of um, always focused on, as much as we can, sonic transparency. And that may not be relevant for all kinds of music, but it's the direction that we've always headed as a company. Um, yeah, maybe maybe some examples will speak louder than words. Yeah, um, I guess we can kind of talking about limiters in general as well. Um, you were mentioning, obviously, it doesn't need to be our limiter by any means. Um, there's a lot of great limiters out there. Um, and actually for a lot of the work, that you may be doing, you may even get away with a stock limiter, depending on how much kind of limiting it is you need to apply it. Um, so this, yeah, it's, it's not kind of like a, we're not trying to push this specifically. Um, a couple of things that I guess we can dive into with regards to the conversation that's already happened and, and our limiter. Um, I don't know if my screen share is on. Um, it is not. Is it? As if it is. Um, so this is the limiter that Mauricio was talking about, um, and in particular this uh, enhanced fader here. Um, so that is something uh, quite unique actually to the Oxford limiter, and it's used to uh, increase perceived loudness, um, add a, like a, an extra kind of density and, and weight to the to the uh, audio, without just um, pushing up the peak level um, or compressing it. Uh, so the way the Oxford limiter works uh, and others is in like a multi-stage process. So you have like the, the input section, and then you have like a pre-process uh, limiter um, with your attack and release timing. And then it goes into this enhanced section here, um, which is akin to a clipper, but not quite. It's got a, some, some timing characteristics going on and a more kind of harmonic, um, perceptual loudness cues. Um, and then we have a bunch of other stuff. So as Richie mentioned, like the, the safe mode, we also have some auto gain, auto comp. So um, these kind of things uh, are much more about how you would um, reconstruct the signal from uh, digital to analog. And it's just kind of making estimations as to whether in a real world, um, you may still be peaking. Um, but in terms of actually how you use it, it's you know, it's relatively straightforward. I mean, to me, the kind of the hard and fast rules are the, the attack and release times. If you want kind of super loud uh, and super limited, really kind of crushed, then you're probably going to want a faster attack and release. However, you're much more likely to distort. Um, <laughs> slowing down the attack and release time is going to give you a typically cleaner signal, and then you can rely on some of like the enhanced functions to tame the rest of the 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 peak which may escape the the pre-processing pre process limiter because of that um, slower attack and release time um, but really i mean as the, the conversation is really about is just 
listen. Uh, so the Sonox limiter can be very transparent when you're using it gently. Um, and that's what a lot of people do, do use it for. Um, it's also quite popular with kind of the dance uh, EDM kind of crowd as well, because actually if you push into it and you do use this enhance function, you can get a real kind of dense um, squash in a good way sound. Um, but again, it's all about finding the right plugin or the right tool for the job. Um, and so there are times when the Oxford Limited probably is going to be the best tool for the job, but there are also times when it won't be. Um, and so it's important to have, you know, a wide palette, but also understand what the limitations of each tool are, um, but also where each tool excels. Uh, and a good way to do that often is to abuse it um, and to just push it beyond its limits, realize when things start to fall apart and then back it off until you're in a place that you're comfortable with. Um, we can play some examples here if uh, something that's interesting, um, or we can go back to the conversation around it. But I mean, the examples are going through StreamYard, so I'm not sure how well uh, that would translate. No, I think it would be great to hear something, Andy, and then Adania and Mauricio and Brian can chime in and then add to the conversation if you're game. Sure. Um, so, you know, the setting it is probably going to be something that uh, the way I would start personally would be from the loudest part. Um, I'm going to want to find how much kind of limiting I'm going to be hitting at that point. Um, so, for example, in this song, it's probably going to be around here. Um, depending on really what the track needs is going to depend on what I'm doing. That audio didn't sound like it was coming through. Um, we lost the audio again. Yeah, I'll lean to our producer, Jordan, to check on that. Um, Let's have a conversation while, while Jordan looks at that and we'll, we'll come back to the audio because um, I'm not sure that was uh, worth Jordan, we'll Jordan mentions uh, just unmute your mic on that channel. Um, Am I muted? Oh, okay, sorry. Is the channel. Cool. Um, so for me, I'd be starting at the loudest point of the song. Um, the genre and, and the mix itself is going to dictate kind of how much limiting I'm going to want to be doing. Um, but the first thing I'm going to do is kind of, you can either bring the threshold down. It depends what we're mastering for as well. Um, nowadays, it's less likely that you're going to be trying to hit, you know, 0, 0.0 or minus 0 0.01 uh, true peak um, because the loudness wars have changed things and the normalization has changed things. And the targets now typically aren't about the highest true peak level, but what your LUFS is sitting at. Um, so you, you could bring the threshold down or you can push the uh, input gain up. Either way, what you're going to do is start uh, hitting a level of, of limiting. And, and you just need to kind of listen for what it is you're trying to achieve. So are you actually, do you want like an audible limit? Are you trying to tame the peaks audibly or are you just trying to shave off the very kind of top of that transient that's perhaps pushing um, a little bit too far? Uh, you know, you may have following processes. Um, typically I, I'd have a limiter towards the end of the chain or, or at the end of the chain, um, but that's not what everyone does. Some people have that before maybe moving into something else. And so, having multi stages of limiting is a good way to um, prevent uh, your next stage from having to over limit. So if, if you have two limiters in a row, quite often that's more transparent than having just a single limiter. Um, anyway, I realize I'm talking a lot and not showing you much. <laughs> Sorry, I'll shut up. So that's way over the top. So with regards to what like a, a limiter can sound like when it's uh, too fast, if I bring these down and push this up, you'll notice that it distorts quite heavily. But if we slow these down, and I'm going to turn the enhance off for now, actually. Um, the 
not sure how well that's translating, but you're probably going to find that there's uh, mu much less distortion. Um, the transients sound a little bit more retained. Um, and so that's kind of a good way of listening to the first things you're setting up when you're setting that limiter is see how much gain reduction is required and what you're trying to achieve and what you want to hear. Uh, set the attack and release time to uh, potentially, uh, with the attack time most limiters, you're not really going to hear a great deal of difference in terms of the, the movement of the limiter. It's not like a compressor so much. Um, I mean, it is a compressor, it's much faster, but you're not going to hear so much shaping of the transient in my, my opinion. Um, but you're going to be able to retain a bit more of the, the original transient, a little bit less distortion that way. Um, yeah, and then once I'm kind of happy with this, if I then feel there's still room to kind of push up the uh, the LUFS, say I want a, a much louder, more kind of in-your-face master, then this is where I'm looks like the enhanced section. I'll just game match this as well now so you can hear the difference without uh, being fooled by the audio volume. So I've gone a bit further than I usually would here, but what you can hear is that's bringing up that kind of low, uh, I say low end volume, not in terms of uh, frequencies, but in, ter in terms of like the dynamic range, so just kind of pulling that forward and, and making things sound more present, more forward, um, and a bit more uh, warm, I guess, would be a word to use, which is a, a dangerous word to use in audio. Um, mm -hmm. because it's <laughs> open to interpretation and, and very loaded, but... Uh, <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, let, let's let's go with that. Thank That's you. great, Andy. Thank you. And so let's uh, next go over to you, Adania. Um, it, this the question is similar, but I think the frame into the conversation is: we had questions about limiters, but tell us about your kit. Like, what's your workspace look like? What tools do you use? And then maybe start with a little conversation about you know limiters and how you apply that. Since for the masterclass, that was a key question from the audience. Yes. Yes. So um, here um, at Sterling Sound, we have like kind of, um, we, well, we use ATCs uh, as monitors, but uh, the rooms, there's four rooms upstairs and they are all designed the same way. So basically with the idea that any engineer can go into a room and work. Um, so they sound um, like super similar and they might have slightly different converters um but um we have a text here that basically kind of take care of that the room i work from uh has converters that are um custom made and i would say uh going back to the analog and stuff part i don't think today you need uh you it's a need it's more a taste thing the analog part uh because also think that when you're in the box that gives you a really really clean chain and for mastering many times you want a really clean slate to start working on every time you start adding like parts to to your chain especially analog there's a there's a slight change in the sound of the end product and unless it's something you really want you have to know you know um how it sounds and be like yeah i want that on purpose but also like i've like i found that cleaner sounds better to me or i just it's my preference and um that's one of the things here is uh it's also because of how fast paced things are here at the studio um we also work digitally mostly because we share computers and different like production rooms and upstairs and, and downstairs. And the only way to really make that work and be able to open a session here or there or everywhere is to work like only in the box. Um, 
and uh, I work, my DAW is uh, Sequoia. I've been working on it since college, basically. And um, I really like how you can gain stakes there. And I, I, I think it's, uh, mm, there's so many points in the chain where you can gain stage by little like steps that is really helpful uh, for me. I use limiting. I mean, obviously limiting is the most important, I would say, in, in mastering. And uh, I don't know somehow what I get from my clients sometimes is they get the impression that uh, we do a lot of compression but we actually do a lot of limiting and very little compression, at least me. I do very little compression and tons of limiting. And um, how they were mentioning before, I like um, to use limiters in steps. So I usually have two to three limiters in a session, which sounds crazy, but uh, just I'm doing so little like maybe one of them is like doing the heavy lifting and then the other is so, so little. Just I'm, I'm trying to get uh, little transient things from these or little like presence from the other one. And it's just kind of adding to the limiting, but also adding to the EQ of the song. Because I think also another thing that's important to know about limiters, like, and I really appreciate what you were saying, that you always try to make limiters that are really clean. Uh, it's just that they, everything that you add into your chain uh, acts almost like as an EQ, uh, because it's going to change uh, the way everything sounds. And that's the important thing going back to listening and listening and listening because um i feel like one of the mistakes that you might do as a mastering engineer when you're trying to start is just adding a bunch of things a bunch of things because you know you see other people do it or you're just excited about all these like eqs limitings and stuff but without maybe wanting to you changing the sound of the song too much the feel of the song the beat of the song so it's just keeping in mind that uh, every little thing you add uh, has to, the, like to get to the final volume you want, you have to kind of make a lot of limiting tricks to kind of maintain the same feel and sound of the song because it's just, in, in, uh, you, can, um, you can't avoid it. When you add six dBs of gain, four dBs of gain, you're changing the sound. So you have to do that and then kind of make tricks to go back to the original sound, but with that new volume. And uh, well, all of that I try to do mostly with limiting and uh, a little bit of EQ. And I don't know if I answered your question. I work a lot of, well, obviously in the room with the ATCs, but I have to say that um, headphones are really important to me. Yes. Yeah, no, I just want to add to that, like uh, making, you know, in my impression here, what I do, I mean, there are, there are like tricks, you mentioned tricks, right? Yes. And I think that there are other ways to make something feels louder, you know? Yes, so yes. Yeah, that's absolutely the, maybe, true. Like you said, EQ, maybe, you know, the frequency response, maybe the timber, maybe, I don't know. Depends. It varies, but yes. you know, maybe I, I just want to add to what you were saying that all those tricks with limiters. Sometimes you have to think that there are other ways other yes. than just limiting a level to make something psychoacoustically be, you know, popping out of the speakers and feel louder, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Like limiting is not uh, is not everything, obviously. Uh, but it's just a, a really important thing. And over limiting is is bad, and it's I feel like a big mistake, especially that people that try to master like their own things would fall into a lot because they just want it loud. So they just throw a limiter and like raise the volume and then call it done, maybe. And um, so basically, when they 
sometimes it happens to us like they send us a reference that they did like that uh but their processing with the limiting was so heavy that it really changed the song completely so for us like to the original song to the reference is like mm -hmm. this i mean this is not like a normal difference now we have to kind of try to recreate that because you you thought you were giving me like you know a loud reference but you kind of messed up the song a lot <laughs> yeah respectfully <laughs> that, that's something that always you know always intrigues me how should we read i mean read or listen in between the line and say okay why they like these you know why is this a reference or you know yes it, it, that's a that's a skill to be developed. yeah you, you have to to listen and kind of take what's good and what you like or what you think they might be liking from that reference but give them the same but better obviously the same feel the same effect but not distorted or not over limited or not too squashed so yeah it's cool. it's tricky so <laughs> well for i, I our, think for our, oh, go ahead go ahead brian and then so i have I something to say to that for, please for our aspiring mastering engineers that's why what andy brought up about level matching is so important yes. because if you if you add limiting and you make it louder you're going to be drawn to that sound because louder is better yes. um and it's, it's, that's a psychoacoustic truism that's true under most circumstances louder is better you a b something the louder one is going to be the preferred one 90 percent of the time but if you level match the before and after then you can truly judge what the limiting has done to the sound and then you can resolve the question that mauricio and adanya br just brought up about did they give us this crappy sounding reference master because they just liked it because it was so much louder than the original mix or is there really something about that harsh sound that they want me to reproduce there I, I i've said the tactless part that you guys were trying to avoid <laughs> you know it, 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 that's interesting because that's another skill it's almost maybe the art of mastering is knowing how to match levels and yes. you know in my critical listening class in the very first day you know i just play two tracks in pro tools exactly the same song but they don't know the only difference is one db and I just ask them, this is not a game, this is not a trick. I just want you to react to whatever you're listening and write words in a paper. Or if you don't want to write, memorize some words and you know, when I stop the song, let's talk about it. And then I do that, A, B, one dB louder, A, B. And then you have all kinds of answers like, oh, it's punchier. You know, the low end is richer, it's lush. It's, oh, I like that one better. Oh, this is too compressive. It's like, man, <laughs> yeah, you know, no bias. You have no bias because you don't know what you're listening yeah. to. So I think uh, Dania mentioned something about like uh, people following trends and say, hey, I have to use these and I have to use these, you know, sub generator and I have to, to use this wider, you know, kind of spread wider something. And this is kind of another type of bias, you know, like. I would say that I would say maybe the social bias, like what people are doing, I'll do the same. And the other thing is, I know that what is, you know, like these MP3 against that 96K. So that's another bias. So we, listening is to me, it's really like I don't know what I'm listening. You know, it's a reactive press process. I, I'm just reacting to something instead of if I'm thinking, I'm not listening. I mean, yeah. I know there are limits for that, but that's kind of the right. Yes. Well, no, I, I. Oh, go ahead. Oh sorry. oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that that I, that I agree, and the way I see these, uh, especially with the level matching, and that is that this is almost like a comparison game, where you constantly have 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 to be going to the original mix without any limiting and compare at the same level and make sure you're adding and not taking from it and mm -hmm. sometimes just because of the level you don't realize because you're not compar comparing like with the same level that you are really not adding and you're taking from the song and uh, so it's just yeah you have to do a lot of compare compare con consciously comparing 
Well, there's a good seg uh, question that's uh, uh, this segue that I'll bring just to answer. We have Michael Ma uh, Mazzaracco, who I, I just met at AES uh, in New York City recently, who uh, teaches at Eastern Suffolk BOCES in Eastern Long Island. They have an um, audio and music program there. And he asked a question earlier. Um, are there any pre-mastering guidelines you can share for mixing engineers? How close is close enough for a mix? Should we avoid master bus compression and effects? So just sort of to the source material that you, Mauricio or Idani are getting, for those who are going to deliver content to you, and Michael is teaching, you know, skills for high schoolers that are going to go on to college or uh, uh, some uh, pro, a pro school, vocational school like uh, Full Sail, and follow Adani's path. Um, just quickly, would you add any uh, comments or give him some suggestions for his students? Yeah. Well, can I start? Yeah. yeah. Sure. Well, you know, the, you know, of course, you have like the. Uh, how can I say the, the bureaucracy? You know, like all your do clean stuff. You know, don't cut the fade, the reverb in the end. That kind of you know uh, housekeeping thing, you have to do that, right? But and that's that's a that's a obvious thing, I would say. You know, as far as levels are concerned, I don't think that's too critical. I mean, should I be at minus six or minus two or minus eighteen? That's something that we can easily adjust in mastering, really. Okay. I mean, I agree I, with that completely. I hope you are listening at a good, a, a, at a health level. You know, like you know what you're doing in your control room, because that might maybe you know the cause of a, like a very low signal or a high signal. You know, but that's easily adjustable in mastering. One thing that I think is critical is if there is just one thing uh like the the reference that Daniel just mentioned let's say I, I don't know the specific case you're referring to but let's say you have a mix like a, a a rock and roll song you know with no compression at all in the snare or nothing happening there just like free picks everywhere it doesn't really sound like a rock song but you know you mix like that and then you Put a limiter there and you know bring up nine dbs and say hey this is my target this is what i want to do so it's just too much i think to for the mastering stage to to address so yeah. get as close as possible as your intention you know to the mix oh but i'm going like at minus seven db af whatever uh, uh, db the loudness I don't care, you know, make it sound musical, make it sound the way you want it to sound. Don't count on me to get yes. like, you know, 70% of the job done. This will not happen. What we'll yeah. get from me is a phone call say, hey, you have to talk. Something's wrong. And I think that's mastering, you know, communication and how, what is happening here? Why, you know, it's, it's just too much like, to believe that the mastering stage will save something. Yes. We can add something like, you know, make it a little different, maybe make it a lot different, but don't think that, oh, I can't use anything in my master bus. You can, maybe limiters are not necessary. I mean, unless they are, they have a creative purpose in there, but, don't hold yourself back, you know, if you think that you're doing something that is artistically related to the song. Just do it. We will be able to understand that and work with that. That's for sure. Yes. I agree with that completely. Like, just <laughs> set, like, realistic expectations <laughs> to what mastering can do, you know? Because, yeah, I mean, sometimes I feel like uh, you probably agree Mauricio, we end up mixing and mastering at the same time. And it's like, not what we're supposed to do. Like, really, like, if you send us something that it's not done, it's not finished, it's not compressed. Like, yeah, we can do something, but it would be way better if you really give us a mix that you're happy with. And it's as loud as you were gonna send your reference or kind of on the ballpark, but you feel better with it. 
you know, because I would say if I if if it if I could say something to people that do this reference thing and add a ton of limiting or processing and then send that as a reference and you like it, just send that and call that your mix instead of, you know, giving us two options that are completely different. Uh, or just stop doing reference mixes completely, you know? Uh, because uh, I think it's it's not yield, it, it will probably not yield the best results uh, as, as if you just, you know, send us what you think sounds good, even if it's louder than what they told you it was supposed to be, you know? Yeah, we may still call back and say, hey, I think something is wrong. Maybe I have to adjust here and there. Uh, what I like, for example, about the Sonox limiter, if I have to go louder than, than I mean, lou louder than louder. I don't know how to express that. Like like louder, -er, you know, <laughs> if I have to make it louder and don't sacrifice the bass, there are tools for that, you know. And I think the, the, the Sonox limiter can do that, you know, many times. But again, the, the the communication channel should be open, you know. And if it's something is overdone, yeah, I will call back and say, "Hey, let me understand what's happening here. Why, you know?" But many times, underdone is worse because you don't have a clear impression of what are the intentions here, you know. And you were probably, uh, I mean. You don't have the same power as the mixing engineer has, you know, to adjust stuff. There is a limit <laughs> for mastering. Yes. Ah, I. Sorry. <laughs> you need are. an audio engineer there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I was just saying, everything has gone so quickly. It's such an engaging conversation, and we're actually a little bit over time. But I want to do a quick round robin to get a couple more answers. Um, so if I I'll, I'll just point a question to one of our panelists, and then I Giles and I have a little bit we'd like to share. And it occurs to me, maybe we should think about coming back and having another uh, session in this series, because there's lots more to talk about technically. Giles and Andy have much more to share. But um, just quickly, uh, Donnie, I'm going to go to you because of a comment you made earlier. We have a student from the University of Toronto in Canada who asks, what kind of demo should I prepare? So when you know you went and knocked on a door, if somebody's yes. going to come to you looking for a job, what would you tell Bernadette she should think about preparing? And we'll do just a quick round robin on a few, on a few questions. So, so we'll start with you. Yes. Um... I mean, if, if I was going to look at, at someone uh, that that prepares like a demo or something for me, I would like to see maybe like a video of a pre before and after of a mastering, um, for example. Uh, also like a good resume where they can really list like what their abilities are and which uh, DAWs they can use. And um you know it's even even though all of that is important i mean me meeting the person well you need to get in the door which is important but i mean just list all the daws you can use try to make a, a little demo if you if you want that with, with a before and after of a mastering um and i i would say that's it and then if you get in the door, just like you have to have, a, you know, good attitude and be very respectful and be willing to learn and just don't overstep. And that's Fantastic. About it. Great advice. I'm going to point the next one to Mauricio. We've talked about this. It's from Jack at Virginia Tech who said, how do you start networking and build a client base? And I know we've talked about this a little bit, but... You've had your 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 practice, your studio in Sao Paulo. What what quick advice would you give to Jack to think about building his uh, Well, I can't overstate the importance of networking. That's key, I and mean, especially today with all the challenges we have. Well, in mastery and many other places, but you know, you just have to have 
I like the the idea of creating like a, what I call a creative infrastructure. Like you have, you know, places you can go. It can be online presence. It can be a lot of things. But maybe much simpler than all that. I had, I always had in my mind, and I think that can be a good advice. You know, just say yes. And I have an example. You know, I had a client that once he had all his masters done uh, in another country for another by another engineer, and he just needed someone to assemble the iTunes, you know, and kind of prepare the deliverables for iTunes. And at the time, you know, he was trying to find a mastering house in Sao Paulo that could do that. Well, there was plenty, but many of them said no. No, I, I don't do that. That's no, that's not a real job. And I said, yeah, I'll do that. Well, that's the artist that, you know, maybe six or seven years after that, we start a relationship like that. And that's the artist that got a Grammy. I mean, he got a Grammy and I luckily I was the mastering engineer. So yeah, I got that too. All right. Well, it's not about the Grammy. I'm saying just say yes. You know, just don't say no, maybe until you have to. You know, there is a limit to that, but just be open, you know, to to, to whatever you have to do, opportunities, you know, like yeah. th there is no small job. And independent clients, you know, that you may say, oh, this client is like not big enough. Don't, that doesn't exist. You know, you have to treat everybody the same because that's how you build your reputation, you know, and what people call like a social capital. Right, that's our assets. And so, what's reputation? Well, I don't know. Reputation is, I, I kind of know, but it's in the artistic field. You know, it's it's difficult to measure. It's kind of intangible. You know, your reputation. Yeah. And to begin with, if you don't have one, you're just starting. So it, it will take time. You know, just say yes, just keep working, and you will realize that to build your reputation you will need to explore your artistic capabilities, you know, uh, your capacity for artistic innovation, maybe, and make people believe and really, not really only believe, but feel that you are contributing creatively to a product, you know? So that's how you start a network and that's how you start a reputation. And that's yeah, key. That's very good advice. And last question for today is going to Brian. Brian, Liz from Florida asks, how much does it cost to study mastering for a career? What are the best online programs? I know you'll have an opinion on this. <laughs> <laughs> well, we live in an age when there are enough different options that you can find the one that suits your needs in terms of of location and cost and speed and so forth. Um, and since I run an online uh, degree program in audio production, uh, my answer is, is difficult to formulate without sounding self-serving, but I like to think that we do a pretty good job. One of the things to recognize though is that I don't think there's any program out there that teaches you mastering and nothing else. We get, uh, I mentioned earlier, we get people uh, asking about the, the program saying, I just need to learn how to master. Well, you don't just need to learn how to master. You need to learn so many things that you don't even know you don't know yet. And that, that humble beginning, that bit of humility to say, okay, here I am, tell me what I need to know in order to progress to the point where I can actually start to understand the difference between mixing and mastering and then the difference between bad mastering and good mastering and then have a, a handle on how I get myself better and better and better as the years go by. Um, and that's a matter of finding some people that you believe in uh, and putting your, your trust in them. Um, we are recording arts degree program, uh, that Adanya graduated from is exclusively offered on campus here. 
She described the lab environment there, which is an important part of that campus experience. And in our mastering uh, labs, we have um, Sequoia uh, and a, a hybrid analog digital uh, chain that you can integrate the two of them and switch between the two of them. So you can basically try to replicate the, your signal path in digital and analog and then hear which one you prefer. Uh, in the online degree program, audio production, we don't have those facilities. Instead, what we have is uh, an approach that really replicates the kind of work that uh, that we've been describing that's you know all in the box, uh, all communicating with people remotely, um, all understanding how to make the computer sit up and dance, uh, how to how to get good work done even in headphones or small monitors when you don't have uh, you know, uh, uh, the kind of facility that uh, uh, that Adanya is is blessed to be able to to work in, and that Mauricio has has created for himself. Um, it's a different way of working, but it is uh, it's very uh, relevant to the way that work is getting done these days. So, and you don't have to move to Winter Park, which is a cool place to move to, but uh, that's that's up to you. So I think you've got a lot of different options out there, but fundamentally you need to find something that you can live with in terms of lifestyle, in terms of locale, and in terms of finances. And you need to talk to the people involved and find the people that you can believe in and, and put your faith in, uh, and then go into it wholeheartedly and put your faith in them and, and, you know, rise to the, to the highest level that you can in that context. Thank you, Brian. That's great guidance. And I will say Mauricio, having been on the MTSU campus, you're a critical listening class. Uh, I know John Merchant, the <laughs> department chair teaches that. And there's so many great places to go and build your, your base of experience like Adania did in, in Mexico and then came to the US. Um, um, so I just want to thank everybody for uh, all the conversation today. It's great to have all of you here. Thank you to Giles and Andy. And in, in closing, in addition to thanking Adania Valencia from Sterling Sound, Mauricio Jargel from Middle Tennessee State University, and Brian Smithers from Full Sail. Thank you to Jordan Nickerson, our producer in the background, to Giles and Andy from Sonox. Thank you so much. And I want to add just one more thing before we leave. Um, Giles, would you just, um, we have a focus rate group in education commitment and students in Middle Tennessee State, both uh, at uh, Full Sail and all campuses have access to education discounts for hardware and for software. So if you search online for focus rate, for example, or for Novation student discounts in, in the US, you'll have access to that. If you verify, you can get a discount code and make purchases at a discount. Our resellers also offer that. And Giles, I know Sonox has a very special discount for academic institutions, for faculty, and for students. Tell us a little bit about that before we sign off today. It's very quick. It's a, a permanent 50% um, discount applied across pretty much our entire range. Um, sadly, it can't be combined with discounts that we offer in promos. Um, but reach out to us if there's anything that you'd like. Um, for faculties, there's a, a, a multi-seat license. Um, I think it's something like $800, $800 for unlimited licenses in a facility. That's basically it. Fantastic. So thank you to you all. Anyone on the stream who would, has more questions, you can go to the uh, to focusrate.com. And if you look for solutions and find education, there is a form there that includes a, I'd like a consultation or to chat with somebody. You can feel free to just reg, uh, fill that form out, send us questions. Jordan and I and the team get those questions and we will definitely get back to you. And for the many good questions that we didn't answer here, we will answer some of those select questions in our roundup for this event, and you will all receive emails if you've registered for, to, for this event to access to our highlights and uh, a little more uh, interesting material, case studies and stories about Full Sail, Middle Tennessee State yeah. and other things. And it's, I just keep it open, anything specifically for me, a question or anything, yeah. Just we'll send pass it them through. Thank yeah. you. We'll definitely tap our panelists for follow-up questions. So sure. thank you all for hanging in there. It was a long session, but it felt like it went by in about 20 minutes. We really appreciate everyone's attention and time today, and we look forward to having you attend the next Masterclass or Pro Audio and Education webinar. Thanks, everybody. Great to have you here today. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.
Thanks.